to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. One more time. Oh, I'm glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. One more time. Oh, he didn't have to let me live. He didn't have to let me live. But I'm glad to be in the service. One more time. <laughs> He didn't have to let me live, oh, he didn't have to let me live, but I'm glad to be in the service one more time. One more time, let's say, oh, I'm glad to be in the service, glad to be in the service, glad to be in the service one more time. I'm glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service one more time. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Even to our online community that are watching at home, it's good to be in the sanctuary. Glad to be in the sanctuary one more time. Uh, glad to be kept by his keeping power. Glad to be in the sanctuary for Bible study tonight. Amen. 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 It's been about three years since we've been in the sanctuary um, for a midweek Bible study um, with, with participants. It's, it's been myself and the audio team, and so with a couple things going on today, I said, you know, let's just come in the sanctuary and see if the saints will meet us. And uh, it's, I enjoy at home, I think, the convenience of it, but ain't nothing like being in the sanctuary, amen? <laughs> Rightly dividing the word of truth, amen? So wherever you may be at home, like we do every week, grab your Bibles, amen, grab uh, your sword, amen, grab your pen and your paper tonight as we go, amen, before the Lord in prayer, um, asking God to um, meet us in tonight's session, that he would illuminate, um, that he would continue to divinely inspire us. I'm excited about what God is doing here, but there's that God is blessing, y'all. God is blessing. I was telling uh, one of the pastors um, that whatever God is doing, you know, I seen that song, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. I'm so glad that in his sovereignty, he's allowing us to experience and to see it. And it's been a wonderful thing. And I'm just excited about how God is saving as he he's doing it like the Bible way. He's doing it just like we saw in the book of Acts. Um, and I, I just I'm just so honored that God would allow us in his sovereignty um, in his sovereignty throughout eternity to allow us to experience this um, um, just renewal, revival. Um, seeing so saved, seeing lives reached, and um, I'm just I'm happy about it. Amen. Amen. Enjoying Jesus, Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, if you have a prayer request tonight, I know we have people watching at home. So if you have a prayer request tonight, throw it in the comment section, like we normally do. I'm going to try to go in between, and it's a little bit different <laughs> this time instead of just staring at the camera. Uh, so again, we're excited about it. Hit the share button, even if you're in the sanctuary. Let somebody know that tonight. Amen. Uh, we are. Uh, uh, we're studying God's word, amen? amen, and we're building on a lesson that we've been uh, dealing with, which is uh, the purpose of the church. And I really think that it's important um, that as we, amen, now have this power, um, that we're empowered of God, and that he has breathed life and instituted the church on the day of Pentecost, that we understand its role, its functionality, and the desire for us uh, to fulfill his purpose here on earth as an extension of his hands and his arms and his legs, um, and I think it's, it's so important. I think sometimes we take for granted um, the church, Christ dying for the church and what it means to be a part of the church. And we don't appreciate it. And when you don't appreciate it, you find yourself out of it. And I think there's one thing God told me to speak to, speak to this culture, this anti-church culture, speak to this culture of independence that this pandemic has brought us where we don't uh, re uh, realize, relish the value of God's presence and being among fellow believers. So I hope that um, as we continue studying this, and, and I'm hoping that a couple of these, uh, couple of these uh, um, summer nights we can come together <laughs> and enjoy the word of God in the sanctuary. So again, everybody, we say praise the Lord. Again, if you have a prayer request, uh, let, it, let it be known. Right, Raise up your hand even here. Amen. Unspoken or spoken. Let's remember to keep um, Lady May Alexander, First Lady Shorter in our prayers, all of our families. Uh, uh, let's continue to keep our Crenshaw neighbors across the street in prayers and the passing of the, the young man who was tragically taken uh, from us. Um, for those that don't know, he came here a couple occasions, and um, it's just saddened to hear that 
a promising young man's life was brought uh, senselessly to an end. So we have much to pray for. Uh, pray for God's covering. Pray for God's protection over his people. And even those who are traveling tonight, let's pray for them. I know some people said they were coming in tonight. So let's pray that wherever they may be, uh, that God uh, would uh, uh, bring them here safely tonight. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your loving kindness, for your compassion, for your grace. We thank you, O oh God, for tonight, this night that we get to rightly divide the word of truth. We thank you because your word is life. The entrance of your word, O oh God, is light. And we thank God for illumination. I pray, O oh God, that tonight something will be said to challenge us in our uh, systematic theology. I pray, O oh God, tonight that something will be said to stir our hearts uh, unto greater works, that we would understand your purpose for us, how we are to function in this last evil day. I pray, O oh God, for revival and renewal. I pray, O oh God, that you would breathe your eternal words of life. I pray, O oh God, that whatever sickness be among us, O oh God, you bring healing. I pray, O oh God, that whatever uh, concern or worry we have, O oh God, that, O oh God, we just cast them at your feet tonight. I pray, O oh God, that you would say something to inspire us and challenge us to dig deeper in you. Let me give you all praise, all glory, and all honor, for the devil is a defeated foe. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Again, praise the Lord to everybody. Amen. Again, to the household of faith, we say praise the Lord. Now, you guys know how we do at home. We begin each Bible class with two passages, or a couple passages of scripture. The first we find in the book of John, chapter number 8, verses 30 through 32, as well as a couple portions of, of uh, scriptures that we find over in the book of 2 Timothy. Amen. And just at home, if you're in the comment section, just give us some hearts, some likes, some thumbs up. Let us know you can hear us. Um, <laughs> Again, we're excited about, amen, being, amen, in the sanctuary tonight, amen? John chapter number 8, verses 30 through 32. Here begin the reading of God's holy word. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's go over to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And verse number 15, here's an admonishment that the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then, of course, we'll close over in the next chapter over, uh, chapter number three, verses number 16 through 17. And here's what the scripture tells us. It tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. For correction, for instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen? Amen. amen. All right. So the purpose of the church, the next few weeks, amen, we're exploring the purpose and the importance of the church. Uh, I think it's important every now and then that we understand that the church a, is an organism that came alive on the day of Pentecost. God breathed into this organism, and now we are a functioning body, amen. Uh, though we have many parts, we're one body with the purpose of completing God's uh, plan, amen, uh, here on earth until he returns for his church. So, again, I, I love being, God bless you, good to see you, man. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, I'm uh, just excited about the chance that we get to be, again, this is our first one in person. So, if you guys remember before the pandemic, pastors always had charts up and play games and stuff like that. So, that's my style of teaching. So sometimes I feel so constricted at home just watching the, <laughs> I feel like I'm glued to the screen. Numbers go up, numbers go down. So, <laughs> amen. But it's good to be in the sanctuary tonight. Amen. So tonight, De help me out tonight, Deacon Johnson. Amen. If you don't mind. Amen. Let's call out some things tonight about, uh, oh, you got bad handwriting. <laughs> Let's see if you don't mind. Call out some things. If, uh, just before we get into the academic and the spiritual elements associated with the church. What do you believe the purpose of the church is? Just chart as you, for those at home that may be visually constrained, at, in the comments section, you can put your opinions as well, but call out some things. What is the purpose of the church as, as, as it relates to you? <laughs> uh, uh, sister, sister uh, uh, cheesecake, <laughs> you know, <laughs> chapter one, verse one, the purpose of the church is? Salvation. Salvation, okay. Like believers, okay, gathering like believers, all right. You can add yours on there too. <laughs> a lighthouse. A lighthouse, all right. Hospital. Hospital, okay. Fueling station. 
fueling station. All right? Go to church if, if, if church has no revival in it. You don't come and uh, anticipate change or get the things you need um, to walk out your life in Christ. Amen? Anyone else? Training or fortification. Fortification training. I love that. Training. Fortification. Revival. Body of Christ, right? <laughs> no wrong answers. And then again, this is your interpretation of what you think the purpose of the church is. All right. Fellowship. Fellowship. Strong balance. All right. <laughs> what I'm not hearing though is 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 some of the stuff that we always drive at. What's the what's the church's responsibility politically? Say so, all right. Politically, do we have what? Is, what about our responsibility to the community? What about our responsibility to the marriages, to the, um, the rearing of children? Oh man, bad heritage. Let me back up. <laughs> Basics. Okay. To pray. Okay. Counseling. Counseling. To serve. Family. I find it quite interesting that we sometimes as churchgoers have difficulty defining what it is our, our own purpose is, if that makes sense. And, and when we don't know what happens is, is the world redefines it for us, right? Because it's the, the political pundits that sit behind the desk uh, that tell the church what the church should be doing, what the church Believe it or not, it's the political pundits who have an opinion about prayer in the church more than the saints have an opinion about prayer in the church. Political pundits and bureaucrats have an opinion on where we should stand on issues of homosexuality, right? This pride month, right? Where's the church pride? Where's the church as it relates to the issues of abortion, the issues of social economical disparities? I don't know if I'm saying that right, right? <laughs> Classism, racism. Does the church have a responsibility in that? Okay. All right. No wrong answer. I'm just, I'm just trying to provoke thought. All right. <laughs> All right. Sometimes the best way to tackle a subject is to deconstruct or to reverse engineer. All right. Sometimes in life, when it comes especially to the word of God, um, we take a look for just an example. We just drive and we drive over a bridge. We don't understand what happened. 80 years ago on heart of someone that says we need a bridge to get us over and what the purpose of that is. We just been driving on that bridge and sometimes until you take the time to reverse engineer and understand the culture and the climate and all the things associated with the necessity of the bridge, sometimes you don't appreciate the bridge. And what I'm beginning to learn more and more and more in Christendom is that we have a lot of people who drive the bridge, proverbially the church, don't understand its purpose, don't understand why it was formed, don't understand um, what God views and uh, the church asks why God is coming back for a church, right? And, and, and what his expectations are and how we are to reprove one another. So, again, over the next couple of weeks, amen, I'm hoping that we can dive a little bit into this and, and uh, renew our purpose and, sense, and understanding and have a better situational understanding of the church's role and responsibility in society, in the community. Most importantly, that we understand uh, <laughs> what it means to be the church individually and holistically. Um, community-wise, as well as what it is to organize. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Church is a town hall for the town hall. Amen. Any other thoughts? This was, this was good for a little bit, all right? All right. <laughs> Any other thoughts about the purpose of the church? Okay. All right. Okay. Community power. Community center. Serve the community. Safe house. Okay. Any other? All right. Let's get into it. Is that all right? <laughs> all right. The first place we start is the book of Acts, chapter number two. We started here last week. Okay. Day of Pentecost. A lot, of, a lot of things broke out in this part of Jerusalem marketplace, and it is here that we receive uh, the revelation of what the 
uh, Prophet Joel speaks of, which is um, a new army rising, a people rising in empowerment. And so the gift of the Holy Ghost falls to a spectacle on the eyes of some people as they see these uneducated Galileans. It's important you understand that. I think sometimes when we preach Pentecost, we fail to realize that the lens of Pentecost is viewed through the eyes of people who feel like these folks in this room, 120 people are unlearned because of Galileans. Galileans, if you take a look at the history of these people, they're, they are individuals who um, are prescribed as being on the lower spectrum of education. They're not the brightest people. So here it is. These not so bright people with a reputation are talking in this weird language. And all these folks of academia, of mind you, Pentecost is a celebration that exceeds even the New Testament. You'd have to go back to the festival week, week uh, festival of the weeks, which is a celebration of bread. So Pentecost is a celebration of bread. It's a celebration of harvest. All right, it's a celebration of Shabbat. All right, it's something that was mandated by God for those Israelites to always come back once a year to the temple to celebrate what God did for them when He rescued them, brought them out over Egypt. All right, out of Egypt, blood on the post. All right, Charles Heston, y'all. All right, <laughs> all right, let my people go. <laughs> all that. Okay, the Lord commemorates. Amen. Uh, celebrations that these people are never to forget what the Lord has done. And so part of the celebration we know as Pentecost is the festival of the Shabbat, the festival of the weeks, which is a festival of the new bread, new harvest. Again, when you think about the principle of something invisible now becoming tangible, now becoming something that brings nourishment. So we even get the purpose of the church before we even get to Pentecost. Because the church in the New Testament is underground. No ham and B3s in in, in New Testament, all right? No, could you imagine Aaron <laughs> revving up, <laughs> you know, to the detriment of people who don't want this Jesus craze to take over? There's a little bit of crazy in the church. You have to understand the hysteria of a man who will come to earth who says he's Jesus. He's, he is God. <laughs> he is not on your list of most popular people, and that's why many of them wanted him dead. But after his ascension, um, the disciples, some 10 days or so, um, are told to wait till they're endued with power. And these people who are uneducated, these people who come from the bottoms, they come from the worst part of town, folks who have no sense, start speaking this language fluently. And they just, you know, you, you ever, you know, seen somebody who you know is from around the way start talking proper? <laughs> All right. <laughs> It's like all of a sudden, like, it's, it's almost like what you imagine now. A, a lot of folks don't know that some of the TV shows you watch, that they're British actors who have learned to, to do slang and know how to talk like they're from South Central L.A. Yeah. or not to talk from there from parts of <laughs> the <laughs> South, all right? And then when you see them on interview with Oprah and all of them, they have this British accent. Yeah, it just does not make sense. This is the scene we see on Pentecost. These crazy folks in a room with a language. We know the Galilean because of the way they look. We know the, you know. They're, they're speaking this foreign language to the amazement of people. And so Peter, the leader, has to come out and say, these folks are not crazy. They're not drunk. Who gets drunk this early in the morning? All that good stuff. You have wine now that's associated with the spirit. All right? Old wine, new skins. All the stuff is just how God, just in the Old Testament, brings all of it to fruition for us to understand that, amen, it's, it's spirit, it, that he is spirit, and that he is to empower us with spirit. So on the day of Pentecost, we have to realize that the purpose of the church really is to be bread because it's a celebration of, of bread, all right? It's our responsibility to feed, all right? The pastor feeds you with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding according to the book of Jeremiah, but the church has to be, if the, what, 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 what would happen if the church had no bread? What would happen if the church had no substance? Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we see right now. You got a lot of people jumping and shouting, and we got stages, and we got special lighting, and we got backdrops, going, but there's no bread. So the people leave malnourished. People have nothing that sticks to their bones. They have nothing to keep them and sustain them. They have nothing that preaches conviction, nothing that preaches them to stay coarse, uh, not to be drifting to and away by the prince of the airs and all the philosophies. No one preaches the Holy Ghost no more. Everybody's saved. You just need a handshake, shake. You can wear, you know, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Churches with no bread, no substance. But again, the church has to be developed, which means that even churches go through periods and cycles. Cycles of replenishment, cycles of underground, cycles of transition, cycles of breaking through. 
Um, so it's quite interesting. But we go to the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 37 says that uh, when they heard this, they were pricked. Men said, what must we do to be saved, right? Uh, men and brethren, what shall we do is the question that is asked of these unlearned people. What, well, what do we do? Isn't it interesting how God gives the answer to, to the affluent, to the folks who are quote-unquote <laughs> unlearned, uneducated? You'd be quite surprised, y'all, how the people that are impress, impressive in life, right, the people who have it all going on are looking for the answers from, from the common folk. Here are these people, a great brilliance, great scholar with great gifts, come to the temple to do normal things, are asking Peter, <laughs> of all people, you know, what's the answer, what's the remedy? It's interesting that, that the church, in addition to being bread, the church has to be the answer. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. We teaching tonight. We teaching tonight. The answer, salvation. The answer when we gather. The answer to the preaching of the gospel. Uh, the answer to the ailments that we talk about when we deal with it being a hospital. The answer, right? Light and darkness. The answer. What do they do? You have a society who hears about this God, hears about this change. They physically see something different. It's confusing, and what this Peter, is, he's requested of, he's requested uh, uh, to give an answer. So I believe that if you use first mentioned principles, now that we have the formation of, 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 of the church, right, first mentioned principle, what is the first thing that the world does is looking for in the church? Looking for the answer. But what happens when I come to the church and the church don't have no answer? Didn't we talk about this a couple months back about being able to give an account, right? <laughs> being able to give, a, to, 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 to give an answer for the hope that lies within us, as the scripture tells us, right? And that's what started the whole journey of us studying system the, uh, system, uh, systematic theology and going through the, the whys of what it is that we believe. Being the answer is part of the purpose of the church. Being the answer. Well, I came to church, right? And now, now that's loaded. That's loaded. Come on, let's, let's, before we even get into the definition, that's loaded. Because there's some things, right, <laughs> that the church can't just do, right? There's, there's some things that, we're, that we are restricted and pro I can't tell. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell people certain things because they will go out and come back and try to sue me. <laughs> Pastor told me. So you have to look at it in the context of everything, but the answer must always be, if you give your life to Jesus, he will settle everything. Amen. The church has to be the ambassador of Jesus because Jesus is the defense, amen, of the church, died for the church, coming back for the church, and above all, is the answer to the world. So the church has to be uh, uh, the, the answer as it relates uh, to revival and to the refilling of the saints and being a safe house. The church has to be the answer, all right? So what does Peter tell him to do? He tells him what we always do. We love to shout about repent, be baptized, right? If you want to be named Jesus Christ, for missionary sins, and you shout the gift of the Holy Ghost. We have the plan of salvation, the formula. This is the answer. He goes on to tell him the promises unto you, but we go down now to verse, and, and, and we see the outbreak. I love verse 41 because if you look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41, it's interesting how we are no longer... <laughs> We're not excited about what the world is excited about. The scripture, that thing just leaped up off the page. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. We don't even get happy anymore about, about church. Ain't that interesting? They gladly heard that there's an answer to life's problems. There's a solution. There's a remedy. We don't, we no longer get happy about Acts 2.38. It's no longer enough. So we have all these deep wonders that want to dive into the spools of the deep concerning, you know, all of these spiritual things. And they find them getting themselves into a, a rabbit trail. They have all these new revelations, all these new, like, oh, that's baby cross. You good. <laughs> um, you know, all these new revelations, all these new found theories, all these new things. It's never enough. They gladly received this answer and began to work. The scripture says that in verse number 41, um, that they gladly received the world, word 
and about 3,000 souls. Mega church, right? <laughs> right, 3,000 souls added that day. But this is what the scripture says. This is what the church went about doing. The scripture says they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. They continued stewing in the things that they had learned. What's the purpose of the church? Church being the answer, which means that the, that the church embraced its mandate. The church embraced the apostolic doctrine. Okay? The scripture says, and they fellowship. Seen that up here. Well, the answer to brokenness, the answer um, to discord, the answer to even the uh, uh, polarizing worldview, as crazy as it sound, sounded, they found strength by encouraging each other in fellowship. If we did a poll of how many people are strange to your family because you're saved, you'd be, you'd be surprised how many people, you're the only one who's come to the knowledge of who this is. So the church was built into fellowship to be able to provide a sense of family. But what do we say now about the church? Church is a cult. That's a cult. That's a cult. Right? Come on now. Let's, let's, let's reverse engineer everything we heard about the church. That's a cult. They get them, them people, them backwards folk. All they want is your money. All they want is your time. All they want is your, you know what I'm saying? You sit down at the table and all you're trying to do is play a good, decent game of spades or dominoes. You got to hear about the transgressions of someone down the street, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And every church now, I deal with it with my own family. I, the other day, I had to go get into it with a cousin. The other day, because of the one of the, the <laughs> one of the uh, <laughs> one of the ministers I took a picture with was wearing a very expensive outfit, and so it was a moratorium on 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 pastors and pastors being crooks. And I already knew, I already saw the conversation coming a mile away. So I had to tell this person that this that this minister actually, <laughs> you know, has a business, had a business before he started preaching. Actually has residual income, but everybody in church is a crook, right? Because that's, that's, that's what happens. So we build the fellowship element of it to be the answer to isolation. Because this is a new form structure. This is a new organism that life is being breathed into. I need you to understand this, y'all, because how many of you all have seen the rise and falls of, 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 a, of a restaurant in your, in, your, in your life? Okay. Let me just... Old, you know, I'm not that old, but remember Bob's big boy. <laughs> pastor, pastor loves to eat, but growing up back in the day, me and my brothers, <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, uh, I remember there's a place here in LA. We used to come up from San Diego. We used to come up. It was a pastrami joint. We used to go to, and I cannot find that place. Johnny's? Is that what it's called? Okay. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, right. But I mean, think about that. I mean, you have a, a great idea, momentum. People are behind it, and all of a sudden, now all these years later, they can't keep up. But the cost associated with it probably had nothing to do with the formula. Food was probably good, just. Didn't have enough to keep going. You have to, could you imagine this organism called the church, Day of Pentecost, all this buzz, all this excitement, all these people behind it, 3,000 strong, breaking bread, fellowshipping, advancing the gospel, and all these new people coming to it, and then all of a sudden you look up and, and there's no more church. And you see it all the time. You see it all the time. Um, you go by abandoned buildings, and you see the cross faded. You see the, the residual... In some places in San Diego, you see stained glass clubs. Oh. You could tell it used to be a church. Because even the church is not exempt from sudden death, in, uh, 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 a sudden infant death syndrome. That's huge. It's prominent in the African American community amongst toddlers. You know, I never forget, you know, we were, you know, they, they pulled us aside to say, you know, you, <laughs> you know, it seems like <laughs> they had a lot more instruction for, the, you know, black family, you know, that was given, had the baby, then, you know, we had our first kid, you know, because that's real. It's not, you can birth something and, and, and be excited about something and it not be able to mature enough to be able to sustain itself and keep itself afloat. Some 2,000 years ago, God breathed on the day of Pentecost and somehow, some way, this church has survived the spools of intellect. It has survived wars. It has survived the philosophies of the day. It has survived um, um, the atrocities of, of dictators, Trump, as well as uh, Napoleons and whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? It has survived 
going underground. It has survived the rigors of slavery. It has survived, amen, even the, 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 the neo-nationalism ploy to tell you that it's a white man's gospel. Somehow, some way, the church has survived. And it keeps surviving because of the people. Because we are the church. That's probably deeper than a lot of us give appreciation for. But at any point in this journey from 2,000 years ago, the church could have broke off. And you see that now. We have so many different religions. We have so many. I mean, all of my apostolic folks, if we can just go through the split from the split from the split to the split. <laughs> one of the best gifts I've ever been given is the history of the Pentecostal music of the world. is written by G.T. Haywood, or not G.T. Haywood, by um, Bishop Golder. And in that book, there's a whole... <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, 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 Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ, and then PCAF, and then this, and then that, and then that, and then from this organization split off this. And and if you took the time to even go now and look at all of the 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 various splits, it's 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 fascinating how you know one disagreement. But we see that in the church. We see that in Scripture. We see Paul telling Barabbas, uh, "Hey, you know, <laughs> you go your way, I go my way." You know, John Mark, he can't be on my ministerial team. He can't be on this praise team. He can't be on <laughs> this evangelism team. You got the, you know, you see that. But somehow, some way, it survives. It survives Corinth. It survives Ephesus. It survives, amen, Thessalonica. It survives all of this. All of the uttermost parts of the world is the gospel. The church remains and it thrives and it continues because of these very principles. The, the, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, literally. Breaking of bread, not just naturally, just as far as eating, but also breaking of bread in Scripture, in prayers. The Scripture says, and fear came upon every soul, many wonders, many signs, um, and above all, amen. And, and all that believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods. That's, I'm telling you, getting people to tithe in the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you sell all your goods? In L.A., you crazy, bro. <laughs> When, when when a one bedroom apartment is going for twenty five hundred dollars, you sell all goods and but they were so committed not to letting it die that if it meant selling and I think more than sometimes the natural tangible needs because we do know they went from house to house we do know they were in John Mark's mother's house we do know that when Peter comes through the gates of the city he has to go somewhere to to find relief right we do know that they had possessions but I I really love this scripture from the perspective of they had a mind that whatever the need was, they weren't going to get so caught up in stuff that it allowed the church to die. The church has to have purpose enough in you, my God, tonight, that, it, that you don't let it die, that you don't stop testifying, that you don't stop breaking bread, that you don't stop prayers, that you don't shut off the lenses of the apostles' doctrine. I know it's, I know it's dated, especially for a young man to be preaching it, but the scripture says that they, they, they imparted them to all men. They took what they had and they satisfied the needs in the church, whatever the needs were. I think we put it somewhere up here, purpose of the church, all right? Gathering place, service to the community. And as a result of them doing that, we know the scripture says that they found, they found favor, they, were, uh, they went from house to house, gladness, singleness of heart, and, and God added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Amen? The concept from a, a definition perspective we talked about last week was ecclesia. So ecclesia, all right, is the definition of the church. Ecclesia has two different meanings, all right? Ecclesia, that's E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. I'll write it up here. Uh, hopefully y'all can catch it at home. Somebody let me know if we have any questions in the comments. I'm, I'm so used to being at home, you guys, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not good at this, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spell it again, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, all right, L-E-S-I-A, Ecclesia, Ecclesia, two different interpretations of that word. In the, in the Old Testament, Ecclesia, the subroot for gathering, it means to gather, it means to assemble. Oh, boy, that's bad. <laughs> Apolog <laughs> Apologies, y'all. <laughs> uh, but it means to assemble, to call out for the purpose of gathering. The institution of the church in the Old Testament was limited by nature to those who follow God Jehovah, but more importantly, subscribe to the teachings of God Jehovah. 
you will notice that when the children of Israel ended up coming out of Egypt, um, there was instruction given to those who wanted to come with them that weren't necessarily Israelites or Hebrews. You had to, you had to follow. <laughs> yeah, you had to follow. This, this is the, you tell them if they want to come, they better do this and they better do that. They got to get on board, all right? So the called out or the church, as we know in the Old Testament, um, by definition, the ecclesia in the Old Testament means a gathering or to assemble. If you take a look at it, even in, in ancient times, the definition means to gather for political purposes or to rally or to gather. So Ecclesia has kind of two different definitions. Um, in the Old Testament, it is a gathering to call out, all right, to assemble, all right. It, throughout the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as uh, the church. They're referred to as the tabernacle of the congregation, the assembly, all right. But again, not the New Testament definition. Again, the Old Testament definition means that they are called out to assemble, to gather together, all right. Ecclesia. However, when we get to the New Testament, Ecclesia that we see in the book of Matthew, chapter number 13. We love to quote that, all right? <laughs> Actually, chapter 16. When Peter gives his declaration of who the Lord is, all right, whom do men say that I am? Jesus is talking to him, all right? Some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, all right? Some Jeremiah, some of the other prophet, but whom do ye say that I am? All right. And it's when then Simon Peter gives his revelation of who the Lord is. Should we could, can we pause there for another revelation of what the purpose of the church is? And that is revelation itself. Revelation itself. Oh, I'm really bad at this. I'm trying to. Yeah, if you want. <laughs> However, you can work that. But revelation itself. Peter, with the revelation, says, amen, that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And so Jesus answered and said unto him, he says, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my father which are in heaven. And so the establishment of the church and its function comes from this revelation. So church has to be a place where you come, where you learn something about God, your purpose, that you cannot get revealed outside of the church. My God. And so he says, because of your revelation, he also goes on to say that upon this rock or on the, upon, upon this revelation, Peter, upon this understanding, I will build my church or my ecclesia. So ecclesia here in Matthew 16, chapter number or Matthew 16 and verse number 18, ecclesia means the called out ones. All right. So different, two different definitions, all right? In the Old Testament, amen, church, congregation, the assembly, the gathering, the Israelites, Hebrews are known as those uh, um, who are called to gather. But in the New Testament, new definition, amen, of the church is the called out. Church, the called out. <laughs> what are we called out? Called out by revelation. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church, all right? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we now get a new understanding of the church. The church now has to be the place, <laughs> amen, to counteract the devil. I, I, <laughs> he says, I will build my church, which means I will build the called out, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Interesting. Interesting. What comes out of the mouth of Jesus? The gates of hell, so if you consider the gates of hell, you consider everything that's the brass of hell, that is the demonic, amen, attack of the enemy, that is the oppressive force of the devil, amen, has an agenda, has a purpose, but there is a safety net that the enemy's plans will prosper in every other place but the church. Check that out, check that out, check that out. He says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, which means the gates of hell will prevail, just not against the church. So then why are you anti-church if this is the one place that counteracts every strategy of the devil, every demonic force, every gate, every win of the devil? The, the safest place, 
in the whole wide world, you know, we say is the will of God. We love to sing that, but the safest place is the church. Amen. Why would I let the enemy beat up something I'm coming back for? <laughs> this anti-church sentiment, this anti this 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 this, this error of the day, this I can pastor myself, y'all. This spirit of the day is at the expense of you being exposed. The church is the one place the enemy cannot wreak habit. <laughs> uh, let me even back up. Maybe the enemy will wreak habit, but he will not prevail. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because do the church have drama? Yeah. Do the church have challenges? Yes. So, do you, so does your job, right? <laughs> so does your circle. Are the people flawed? Absolutely. Do the people make mistakes? Absolutely. Are, do things happen in the structure, in the confines of the church? Yeah. But the one promise we get here is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The institution of those who are called out have a divine mechanism built in protection by God Jehovah manifested in flesh, and his name is Jesus. And he takes personal <laughs> inventory of the church. He takes personal care of the church that if you are found in the church triumphant, no matter how difficult light gives, amen, and no, ma no difficult how society may blow, no, no matter what the course may bring, there is a security that is in the safety of the church triumphant. My God. On your worst day, with the enemy brewing all kind of hell, and the gates of hell, the, the, the brass of heaven, every demonic force attempting to knock you off course, in the church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against, against the called out ones. <laughs> and he goes on to say, what's up, though? He says, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom, which means that the church is a place of empowerment. My God. My God. My God, I should have brought a rag out here. I didn't think I was going to do all this <laughs> tonight. Yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. Um, but look at the empowerment of the church. The church should be a place of empowerment because bestowed upon the one who I'm making the leader or establishing based on faith. This is based upon revelation. The revelation we must have is victory in the church. But if you always see the church as a place, God bless you, thank you so much, a place of defeat. A place of, of where the enemy comes in and tries to counteract its purpose, then you will you what you will fail to realize is that God will protect himself against himself. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by that? Your body is designed to counteract everything that's trying to kill it even now. When you get a fever, your body goes into work. <laughs> ah! ah. That's why you start breaking out in sweat. That's why you, because in your members is something to design to try to counteract. So whether you take a Tylenol or not, the body itself will come to its own aid because the Bible, or the body recognizes that something on the inside of it, amen, is distressed, is, is, is in, in despair. Do you think for one moment that the, that the, that the Lord is afraid of, of, of the soothsayers and the people that come in here to speak against it? He will fight against even the things trying to kill the church because the gates of hell will not prevail. My God. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You have a question. First of all, it's so nice to raise your hand in class. Right. <laughs> this is weird. For y'all at home, this is weird because it's a, it, we're here in the sanctuary, and sometimes I can't even see the questions online. So it's our first time back in the sanctuary since the pandemic. So. Praise be to God. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so because of everything that you're saying, mm -hmm. um, I'm still way back where the question was asked, you know, how is it that a church is going to be able to stand? Yeah. And um, I think the answer, at least for me, is coming now. Mm -hmm. Because the, the fuel behind the church is the power of God. Yeah. This, this is it. And as he, I'm not teaching, I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. As he's um, fueling the church, mm -hmm. he's, he's bringing out the purpose. And yeah. this is why the church can't be defeated. Right. Uh, storefronts can shut down, mm -hmm. but the church itself, mm -hmm. the spirit and power behind it is a power. The spirit and power behind it is the power of God. 
which right. is eternal, immortal. So it cannot die. Right. And if it, just like you're saying, if anything comes against it to fight it, you're actually fighting the Lord when you're fighting his church. Right. Because he's the fuel behind the church. So, so, so what happens on the day of Pentecost? There can be no church without the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's why you can't downplay what you have. I, 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 feel, I feel my help, y'all, and I'm trying not to go crazy in here right now. I'm trying not to go crazy, y'all. No Holy Ghost, no church. Because he sets the purpose in motion, but the church does not become established until the Holy Ghost falls. So you don't have a church if you don't have the Holy Ghost. I, I, I mean, no disrespect. There's a lot of good people who are doing a lot of good community work. There are a lot of people doing a lot of good training and development. It's a lot, but it's not a church if they don't got the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 How can the Holy Ghost be defeated? How can you? That's, that's, that's why I have a difficult time with people who say they got the Holy Ghost but have no staying power. Who, what, what power can, can undo the power of God? The, 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 the pneumonia, uh, <laughs> pneumonia, or where we get pneumonia from, uh, 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 the, the, the pneumo, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the wind of God that's, in, that's breathed into the church, the fire that comes, the power that comes to the church is a power to literally overcome scorpions, is overcome every plan of the enemy. The power we have on the inside of us is not, amen, something to play with. It is that, it is the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Ah, in the church is the reason why the church survives. God is a spirit. That spirit breathed upon us, empowers us, and empowers the church. Without, without the Holy Ghost, there is no church. We just have a lot of good people doing a lot of good stuff, <laughs> you know, then that hold themselves to a, to a certain moral conduct. That's why you have some churches that say you could smoke a black and mild and still be saved. That's not a church. Because how can you have the church? Again, I'm not trying to offend. I already, I already know. Send the hate. Send the hate mail. Send the <laughs> it's not without the Holy Ghost. Right. Praise the Lord, Pastor. <laughs> and you also said the answer, which is um, Peter's revelation. Yeah. Said, upon this rock, I, I will build, build. my and church. So the Lord is actually building the church by his power right. and his, his will and by his good pleasure. That's why it can't be defeated. Mm -hmm. you, just taught, you just taught that. Come on, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, um, We're going to give you the mic because we got people at home that want to hear the question. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So just for my understanding, I hear you talking about two different things. Well, the same thing, but in two different ways. Mm -hmm. The physical, actual church, mm -hmm. and then the spiritual church. So is that correct? That's yes. That's what I'm hearing? Oh, okay. Yes. But, but, but again, many members, one body, right? The church, the church's physical should match its spiritual intention. It should. Now, mind you, anybody can go sign up for 5013C and make themselves a church. We have the church. We Right now, there's the church of Brian. There's the church of, <laughs> go look them up. Anybody by the state of California's regulation that has a spiritual belief system or, or the parameters of a 5013C can establish a church. It does not mean it is the church of the living God. How can it be the church of the living God and God's spirit not breathe on it? And so you have a lot of physical churches that are just that, physical buildings. But if the spirit of God is not breathing in the church and there's no, how do we know the presence of God is, is, is moving in the church? Come on, somebody talk to me. Talk to me. We're in class. We're talking. We see deliverance. We see signs and wonders. We see transformation. We see power, right? We see the tangible presence of God. I came into the sanctuary feeling some kind of way and I left the presence of, because the spirit of God is moving. All right? Living, living church. How do we go to churches and, and go for a few hours and feel good and feel, you know, empowered and stimulated and all that kind of good stuff and encouraged, but no deliverance take place. The church of the living God is fueled by the spirit of God and is endorsed by the Holy Ghost, which fell on the day of Pentecost. Which is why the Apostle Paul has to correct and correct the church. He has to tell the church like, hey, you have God's spirit. 
You have God's empowerment. You have God's power. You're supposed to live another way. Now, we get all caught up in standards of holiness, and we get, or we get what is called personal preference. But can't nobody convict you like the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because if you got the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will tell you. The other day I was watching a, a, a TV show that didn't have nothing going on, but it was just going crazy. It was going crazy, and the Lord just said, you need to turn that off. It was one of the mob kind of like, <laughs> but I could tell like from a demonic perspective from where it was that there was some stuff that was about to, you know, and I didn't need to see that. Amen. Didn't be exposed Amen. to that at 10 o'clock at night. Didn't need Amen. to, you know. Amen. So, again, the, you know, the rev- church is built on the revelation of an empowerment of it being a source to counteract Satan. How can we counteract Satan with no power? Okay. So the purpose of the church has to be a place of empowerment. Amen. It has to be. It has to be. I don't want to be in a church that ain't got no power. Amen. <laughs> and I'm not talking about political power. No. Or you can make a difference outside the church and there be no change inside the church. Oh, help us. It's not, it's not a shot because there are some, there are some great Conscious people in the name of Christendom who <laughs> I think missed it. All right. So in the New Testament church, the New Testament church, the church is founded by Jesus Christ himself. I will leave you the comforter. He will be in you. I love when he says that, that he, <laughs> as y'all can tell, I'm geeked about this whole series of messages empowered. All right. <laughs> because, I mean, it's nothing like the revelation understanding of the Holy Ghost itself. All right. But. Again, Christ himself, amen, as expressed and now manifest through the gift of the Holy Ghost operates in the church, all right? Um, Is the assembly, so the church of Christ that we know that is found in the New Testament, amen, is an assembly of believers joined to Christ's spiritual body by the Holy Ghost. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13 tells us, for we are or for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, um, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. All right? So again, spiritual regeneration by the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right? At the moment of regeneration, amen, starts, amen, this newfound endeavor called the church. We get that in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 3. Apologize, y'all. I always start off good and then end up going. <laughs> Titus chapter number 3, all right? And, and um, um, verse number uh, 3 through 6 helps us again understand what the gift of the Holy Ghost does, what regeneration is, and how we can now define what the church is, all right? Verse number three tells us, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. This is life before Christ, life before his spirit enters, okay? Verse number four says, but after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, Toward man appeared, all right, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By what? The washing of what? Regeneration and what? Renewing of the Holy Ghost, which what? He shed on us abundantly, what? Through Jesus Christ, (laughs) our Savior, all right? So again, regeneration, all right, now has come into our lives. Amen is expressed, amen, by the washing of regeneration, which refers to baptism, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is the filling of the Holy Ghost, all right? Um, So at this moment, amen, we are now all placed in what we know to be the church, amen, in the Lord Jesus Christ as him being our Savior. Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter number 16. Acts 16 and verse number 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved and thy house. All right. So now that we have the constructs, 
of regeneration, amen, as expressed in the book of 1 Corinthians, the moment of regeneration as expressed in the book of Titus, amen, knowing now that we are found in the Lord Jesus Christ through salvation, amen, we are now called to be a local body of believers who are called upon, amen, now to carry out all the things we talked about as the purpose. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10. Interesting how the writer of Hebrews, we don't know, amen, who the writer is, amen. He's an anonymous writer, so, so we believe. However, he draws this conclusion by saying this, our responsibility is not the forsaking, the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. <laughs> So now we're introduced to a new concept of the purpose of the church. All right? That was uh, Hebrews 10 and verse number 25. Hebrews 10 and 25. All right? So our coming together through identification, through regeneration, all right, under the mandate of salvation and our hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, now the writer of Hebrews tells those who are scattered, you have to understand the context. The book of Hebrews, we don't know who the author is, but we do know that the saints and people who have come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and even those who grew up under the Israelites or, or former Hebrews who are scattered all across the world, who are now dealing with new society, dealing with new realities. He goes and says, hey, even during your time in the Old Testament, you were called to gather. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, look at the gathering. Every morning they get up and they get manna. They have to gather. <laughs> ah, whoo, shetaba. They have to get up and gather quail. They have to get up and gather to receive the instruction. Sorry, y'all online. I'm sorry. I got happy on this mic. In my <laughs> the playback. They had to gather to receive instruction. Gather around the base of the mountain as Moses goes up to the, to the top to talk to God. There's a gathering of the people who want to hear from God. He says, those of you that are used to gathering, don't scatter yourselves. This writer is talking to those new converts as well. So the new converts are dealing with new realities, the new realities of oppression, the new realities of the new gadgets and the gadgets. Y'all, I, I think we think we're distracted by cell phones. <laughs> you know how easy it could have been to be distracted when this phenomenon Jesus leaves the scene? He's popular. I need y'all to catch that. Catch that. Come alive for a quick moment. One minute he's blessing bread, breaking bread, and 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 then the next, what happened to Jesus? Man, that dude, Jesus, that was, that was, you know, man, healing the blind and and and. <laughs> man, could you imagine that bus stop? Man, what happened? Remember, remember Jesus when Jesus came in and that man's hand was withered. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> Remember when Jesus went over there and he was sitting down at the, at, at the house and he was eating and, and, and the girl, you know, was going off and she was crying and, you know, dried her tears with his hands. Wasn't that true? Ain't it crazy how we forget people who passed just a month ago? We had an elder that passed away, had a funeral here, and he was like, who was he? Who was he again? Didn't even know who he was. Could you imagine someone as brilliant as Jesus making an impact on the world? And people forgetting his message, people forgetting his lessons, people forgetting the very things he's taught. And so he's speaking to people who are scattered in life because they're distracted, not by cell phones. They're distracted by life and by philosophies and by the newest things because the church has to avoid sins. It has to stay alive. So he says, those of you that gathered for bread when you were in the wilderness, that gathered, ah, the shaman, that gathered at the base of the mountain to hear what God had to say next, that gathered to make sure they had to get, if, if you were not in the remnant, it was not promised that he would be a, 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 a pillow of a, 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 a fire at night and a cloud by day. You had to be part of the called out to receive the benefits of God. He's speaking to a gathering. He's speaking to a, I, I, I apologize, y'all. This is getting good to me. <laughs> this is getting good to me. You were called out. Forsake not the assemblies of yourself. Remember what it was like when you depended upon his bread. And he says, he says this with all contri uh, contrition, uh, 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 with a contrite heart. He says this to them 
We don't know who it is. We don't know if it's Peter. We don't know if it's Paul. We don't know. But it says, forsake not the assembly of yourself in the manner that some folks have who have deserted bread, who have, de who have deserted purpose, who have deserted protection. Look at how God works. He protected these people against the institution of the Egyptians. I need you to understand how how God took personal care of a people who were oppressed and kept multiplying with an army. If you have to put them in the context of what we see today, they were a superpower. They were the largest military force on earth, larger than what you would consider the Russians who's getting trounced right now. All right. That's kind of how I liken them to like the, how Ukraine is, is doing work with, you know, you know, stronger, bigger, supposed to be winning, supposed to be flexing the muscle, but somehow you have this pesky, amen, a group of people who keep overcoming. This is what I see, but God protected them against, amen, the, the Egyptians, the Israelites. They kept multiplying. Why? Because they gathered themselves together to understand that they were peculiar. They were called out. And as long as they remembered what their purpose was and who it was that was supplying the manna, who it was that was supplying the quail, who it was that was providing shade and who was providing fire at night and who it was and what they what was expected of them. They always had God's divine protection. What do we do now? We get a little piece of money and we don't and, and we don't we don't got to come no more. We buy a few books. We don't got to come no more. That's man made stuff. And I'm free now. And the Old Testament is on the way and all that kind of stuff. And God is saying, I'm still looking for the called out. I'm still I'm still I'm, 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 I'm still calling a remnant to myself. I'm still identifying people that I will do everything for. How the gates of hell will not prevail against this people. <laughs> ah, well, Shema, these people, these people, these people. So when we downplay who we are, <laughs> we downplay the protective order of God. <sighs> when we say the church is not good enough, when we when <laughs> when we join the critics and the criticism of the church and when we forsake the assembling of ourselves, he says, what you do is you say you don't want your meal this week. And think about think about God, the businessman knew just enough to give them and said, if you get too much, it'll turn into worms. <laughs> Woo, God protected them. They didn't know how to fight. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They didn't know how to fight. So to the point that when they got coming out of Egypt, the Lord has to change their strategy because if they saw the enemy, they would think they were going to lose altogether. So he backed them up and took them another way because they hadn't fought before. These are people that didn't know how to fight. They didn't know anything other to do but to, to, to stay in the protective order of God. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some things that we will never know how to do in the world system. But as long as we've got the Holy Ghost, he fights for us. He defends us. He protects us. <laughs> you live under a protective order of God where the enemy can only do so much. Why? Because you're part of the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. You live under the protective order of God. No matter how hard the enemy tries to entice you and pull you so many ways, God, again, when you start feeling like, hey, you know what? I feel sickness coming over me. He'll defend himself and you'll start healing yourself because that's how God's order works. That's the brilliance of God. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. This local group of believers meet regularly. Let's go to Ephesians 4. And, and trust me, y'all, there is so much more. I'm going to get into this. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Yeah. We have Bethesda. What God is doing in this church, we need to know our purpose. Because this church is growing like crazy, y'all. I hope y'all really seeing what's happening on Sundays. You come in here now. When I started pastoring, I used to be able to know who everybody was. I come in, I don't even know half the people that come up in here. I just say, Hi, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you don't remember my name? <laughs> uh, I'll be making it up. <laughs> God bless you, sister. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. And they're coming in and they're saying to us, if you forget, for those, and I, 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 I apologize in advance for how offensive it might sound. For those who feel like this is, I don't recognize this church no more, kind of stuff like that. There are people who say, if you won't appreciate what God is doing, I will. There's no such thing as old Bethesda, new Bethesda. I, I should have y'all cut off. <laughs> cut off the string. But there's some people who are so used to what God is doing that you're offended about the things that God desires to do. He says, I'm a progressive God. Upon this rock, I will build. Who tells God to stop building? Who tells God to turn off his imagination? Who tells God that he can't stop 
Amen. building you and molding you. Amen. Go, tell, go tell God he's maxed out. He's got resources you ain't even heard of. He got vibranium you ain't even heard of. <laughs> stuff they're making up in movies to try to keep up with. There's some stuff that we don't even, aren't even privy to. And God says, I'm not done building you, building the church. <laughs> Ephesians, Ephesians 4. My God. If you don't know your purpose, someone else will define it for you. <laughs> so to help this body of believers... To, to help this body that is to, to go out. Um, even if you back up to verse 11, he says, and he gave some apostles, right? Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the strengthening of this body. He goes on to say, for the work of the ministry. What is the purpose of the church? <laughs> what is the ministry? What is the work? that we've been called to do. And he goes on and he says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And what are we going to do? He says, what we do, this work for the ministry. What is ministry? Ministry is service. Service of people. It's not unto us. <laughs> if you ever want to know what ministry is, if you just want to just take a word for word translation of it, ministry is people. Ministry is people, young people, young, young ministry, youth ministry, young people, <laughs> seniors ministry, old people, <laughs> seasoned people, right? Bus ministry, people who need bus, all right? Kitchen ministry, people who need food. All these things are people induced. Ministry is about people, all right? So for the work of people who need what? Help, who need hope, who need support, who need training, who need development. What is the purpose of the church? To do that. Why? For the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay. What does it mean to edify? Somebody give me some definition. To build up. To fortify. Then we have fortification up here. To edify, all right? To edify. To bring to life. Uh, to bring to purpose. To bring to complete understanding of one's purpose. To edify, all right? For the edifying of the body of Christ. But he goes further. He says what? Till all have come unto the unity of the faith. Ministry can't be aimless. The purpose of the church cannot be aimless. It's got to be that everything draws to the unity of the faith. My God, this is, this is healthy, y'all. And in the unity of the faith, we draw what? The next point, which is in the knowledge of the Son of God. Every effort that we have that's people-imposed is so that when me serving in the kitchen people brings you to a faith of something greater that brings you to the knowledge of Jesus. I, I, it can't be, it, it's not ministry if we just leave feeling good. Everything that we do has to point people to the purpose of the church, which is Jesus. I built the church. I protect the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Unto a perfect man, my God. The knowledge of Jesus Christ unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then he goes on to say that if we're part of the church, that that there's a maturity that's required of the church. Verse number 14, he goes on to say that we henceforth are no more children. Ain't it crazy? <laughs> the things that we do, children's ministry, all right, is for their development. But when we're called into the church triumphant. Amen. We're called into maturity. It takes maturity to, to sell of your things. It takes maturity in class to break bread. Huh? What can the church not be? Remember, I asked you to take a look at it from a political perspective. There's no isms and schisms. Racism and bigotry and classism in the church. Not if we're maturity, not if we're, if we're striving toward maturity. He says that we are henceforth no more children. Although the church is growing in development, we're moving from faith to faith. <laughs> ah, it's interesting that when you start a marriage, my wife tells me all the time, Kyron, you're not the same Tara that you married. Amen. I've, I've, I've matured. You have to find where I am now and love where I am now and vice versa. 
I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> we're not 20 something year olds standing at the altar. We're now, you know, dealing with life and dealing with responsibility, dealing with stress, dealing with a, <laughs> a changing world, dealing now with, 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 with health issues and dealing now with bearing children and dealing now with the changes of society and dealing with all the things that come along with it. We're no longer children. He says, toss to and fro. So upon this rock, <laughs> stability, the church has to be stable. Let's just walk through the door. Church has to be stable. Church can't be on the whim, just falling in between what we're doing today. You know, like you had a wobbling sign outside the tax place with the <laughs> blowing in the wind. Oh, we're doing this this week. We're doing this this week. We're changing this week. We're doing this this week. We No, the church has to represent stability. And the one, and, 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 and although the political environment is going up and down. Come on now, the stock market is going up and down. All the stuff is going up and down in life. Uh, 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 philosophies about marriage and, and, and our world thinking, our system is changing. There's no stability anywhere. There's one place there has to be stability. It is the church. I need to know what my expectation is and purpose of the church is. And I can come find hope. I can come find uh, 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 pr uh, uh, protection and above all, counteract the devil himself which means the church has to be a place of truth. Church, stop telling the truth about stuff. Afraid to confront the culture. And God says, I'm not scared of the culture. The gates of hell will not prevail. So we bring in a little bit of unleavened. We bring in a little bit of stuff to, to try to keep up with something that God is trying to count. <laughs> God is fighting the things that we think are bringing people in, and God is fighting against that. That little bit of stuff that comes in that blurs the line, all that kind of stuff, and he counteracts Satan himself. Gates of hell will not, we call it being progressive. We call it being, you know, all these kind of things. And, and, and God is saying, you don't even have to play yourself about being progressive because I am the spool of innovation. Can't nobody out-engineer God. Can't nobody out-market God. Woo, wake up, church. Wake up, church. Hear the spirit of the living God speaking to us. Anything that you lack, Come to me and I'll show you how to get it done. Yes. But when you come into my house, I don't expect anything but revelation. Yes, sir. Not this false. <laughs> uh, let me close the book. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, God. Not tossed to and fro. Amen. Carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. A deceived church. This is all the stuff that we read about in the book of Revelation. This is all the stuff that we read about when Paul has to address the foolishness taking place at a church in Galatia by saying, who bewitched you? Who deceived you? Who came in with all this crafty and enticing stuff to get you to undermine the power that's been invested on the inside of you? Who's working against the knowledge of God? Ah, the church has to be stable in unstable times. The church has to be a place of revelation in unstable times. The place, the church still has to be a church to tell the truth in a day when everybody's lying for popularity purposes. God says, you think I'm going to be left without a... You I, I, the Lord told me one night, and I'm closing on this. You think I'm going to be outdone by the devil? If I'm a jealous God... You think I'm just going to let the enemy win? He says, I'm going to raise up some voices to tell the truth because I'm a jealous God. <laughs> ah, you think heaven, you think hell is enlarging itself daily and that and God and his competitive nature being a jealous God is satisfied with that. No, he's going to raise up revelation in this day. He's going to raise up truth. God is not going to be outdone by the smoke and mirrors and the spectacles of the day. And that's why I'm going to speak to some of even some of you pastors that are discouraged by by what you think are people who are not telling the truth, who seem to be advancing and progressing and all this kind of stuff. I, I hear the Lord saying, I'm a jealous God. And somebody telling the truth is going to reap the benefit of telling the truth in the day and age when people are going to finally get the sugar daddies out of their ear and come back to truth. Amen. It's the truth. It's, it's the truth. That's all I can do tonight, y'all. <laughs> but we're going, we're going further. God says, Bethesda, you got to know your purpose because I'm shifting some things. 
even in this house, I'm doing some things unorthodox and it's making people uncomfortable. But the only thing I'm doing is I'm reigniting the purpose of the church. Because when you know your purpose, it don't matter how, <laughs> how would you stand at the grocery store and not tell somebody and you are the living church or the living yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not just the physical building, but an agent of the church. Yeah. My, oh. <laughs> ah. We must understand our purpose, understand the importance and the significance of the church, and understand that God is still looking for those who are called out. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing has changed. The only difference is that I breathe my life into the church. <laughs> Ain't it good to be back in the sanctuary, y'all? <laughs> Again, to our online community, this is our first Bible class back in the sanctuary, and um, you know we're going to explore a few more of these in-person sessions in the summer, you know, uh, some of our senior saints that don't, you know, I don't know what's going on in Southern California He's, uh, <laughs> with, this, with this gloom, but, uh, but nevertheless, thank God for keeping us, thank God for uh, the purpose of the church. Um, you don't know the Lord Jesus is part of your sin, you certainly, they can put the number up, I'm here now, so you can come on down and get baptized on a Tuesday night. Get the Holy Ghost or on a Wednesday night. <laughs> Come on down, whatever night it is. <laughs> Come on down and receive encouragement of the Lord. And so we certainly thank God for each and every one of you being here with us. Amen. And we know that God is going. God is blessing in a special way. Let's remember all of our announcements. Step out on faith, baby. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Um, want to remind you this upcoming Saturday morning is... Um, um, Saturday morning prayer. It sets the tone for what God's been doing. Uh, his crazy move that he's been having on Sunday mornings. And we're just believing that the water is going to remain troubled and that someone's going to receive the Holy Ghost. And he will be getting the Holy Ghost before church started. That's what it's all about. Amen. That's what it's all about. Amen. And, and it's all right, baby girl. Go ahead. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Amen. Um, Right, come on to this altar. <laughs> Amen. But we believe, we believe in what God is doing here. We certainly thank and praise God for all of you joining us and being with us tonight. And um, we're going to be looking forward to God strengthening us. Amen. As we endeavor to be the church that he's called for. He's coming back for church. Amen. He's not coming back for individuals. He's coming back for church. And we hope to get to the, to the root of what that means. Because although... It is individual, individual as it relates to your salvation. You are the church. So he's coming back for a church. He's coming back for a bride. What an honor it is to be a part of this. What an honor it is, y'all. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Just glad to be saved. Just glad to know him. Just glad to be in the fellowship of him. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, O oh God, for illumination, revelation. I pray, O oh God, that something was said tonight on our heart to stir us. Amen. To be reminded of our purpose and the importance of the church, oh God. I pray, oh God, that even those who watch the broadcast, wherever they may be, all across this world, literally, I pray that something was said to stimulate us and uh, to mature us, uh, to fully embrace your plan and purpose for our lives, oh God. I pray, oh God, for the stability of the church. That's the individual, God, that's representative of the church, oh God. I pray for their stability. I pray that for the reminder that the gates of hell shall not prevail against them, even though they find themselves in seasons of transition, seasons of trying. And I hope they would understand they live under the divine protective order of God. Hallelujah. I pray, O oh God, for strength. I pray, O oh God, that you will continue being God in our midst. Let your spirit have its way. Empower your people to be the church you call for for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. It's been a while since we've done this. I don't even know what to do uh, as far as offering. So if you got an offering, <laughs> Deke, you got the, <laughs> amen, amen. We can give a midweek offering um, on the screen. They're going to put up for those at home, our cash app and PayPal and Zelle information. You can give that. I, I really don't know what to do, y'all. It's like <laughs> being, it's good to be back in the sanctuary. And, um, but it's, I'm glad that God has allowed us to be ambidextrous in the season, to be able to serve those that can't be, um, in the sanctuary, um, but we're excited about what God is doing, amen, and um, as we give, we know God is multiplying, as we give, I hope that there's a sense of renewal. I'm going to get into some of those things as well, the purpose of the church, how, amen, God put his, amen, blue on the church, amen, to be able to sustain the church, to be able to support the church, what we must do um, to counteract uh, what the enemy wants to do, amen, to prevent us from being prosperous, to 
do the things that God has called us to do as far as ministry. So I hope that you'll be patient with us as we walk through that. Amen? Amen. Amen. But again, our thanks to our guests and visitors for being with us. See you. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Amen. Just excited about what God is doing here at Bethesda. And again, let's remember, let's get home. Amen. It's Crenshaw, so let's <laughs> let's not tarry, saints. Amen. <laughs> but above all, amen. Let's, amen. Let's, if you enjoyed tonight, um, you know, just again, give us some feedback. Uh, for those of you that are watching at home, give us some feedback. Send us a message or something or even Sunday. Let us know so we can try to plan accordingly. There have been some people who said, what about vacation Bible study and, and things like that. So we have a lot to think about. We're trying not to overdo things. There's still some things out there, but um, we feel empowered of God, amen, to start bringing back, you know, some of our in-person midweek uh, services. Something about being in the classroom environment in the sanctuary just does something to my heart, amen? Amen. 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 We're standing to be dismissed, amen? We're standing to be dismissed. Again, we thank God for his word. We thank you all for joining us. Amen. We hope that you have a blessed rest of the week. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you, O oh God, for your guidance. We pray, O oh God, that as we leave this place, O oh God, you would hide this word in our heart, that a renewed sense of purpose would come to us, that we would follow your statutes and precepts, and that we would live a life of accountability, O oh God, and that we'd walk circumspectly, that we'd walk with an understanding and awareness of what our purpose is for such a time as this. Help us not to forsake the assembly of ourselves. Help us to keep coming for bread. Keep coming for encouragement. Help us, oh God, to ignite the fire of personal evangelism, that we invite somebody else to be part of this before it's everlasting too late, oh God. I pray that you'd wash away all of our sins, a lot of all, trans, uh, 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 all of our transgressions, and forgive us of all of our iniquities. I pray, oh God, that you would sober us um, for kingdom living in this last and evil day, oh God. We pray, oh God, that your spirit would fall, that we would leave empowered, strengthened, bring us back to our destinations and uh, safely, O oh God, and bring us back into this house at the appointed hour with the praise of heart unto you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you all. Show love to somebody. Amen. <laughs> amen.